Hello everyone, I'm happy to open this exciting seminar about future directions in virtual care. As we're all going through COVID-19 and uh, virtual medicine has become something of everyday life, we're thinking about where to go next. How are we going to see virtual medicine or medicine in that account uh, in 10 years from now? What kind of tools, what kind of technologies? What kind of uh, delivery models are we going to be seeing over the next decade? With the transition of medicine from the hospital to home, telemedicine will have to play a critical role in allowing us to care for more acute patients at home than we are doing today. Technology will allow us to examine patients from afar, to provide therapy, to assess, to monitor, to communicate with our patients much better. There's going to be a huge amount of innovation needed to make sure we utilize all the technological tools we have, starting from sensors to devices to artificial intelligence solutions that will allow us to comprehend and understand how patients are doing in their environment. The home environment will change as we'll add more technology, Internet of Things and sensors around the home to turn the home environment into a medical environment, both for acute care as well as chronic care. We're going to see a big shift from hospital care to home, but we think still the expertise, the clinical expertise, will remain within the hospital as we move forward. It's not just about acute care and chronic disease management, which uh, has become quite well known around telemedicine right now, but it's also about rehabilitation. How are we going to take rehabilitation to the next level in our own natural environment, in our own homes? At Chiba Medical Center, we've started a tele-rehabilitation program back in 2012. You're going to hear more about it on the seminar. We've uh, had quite a lot of experience over the past 10 years doing that, with hundreds of thousands of, uh, of sessions being performed on patients through telemedicine. Technology will allow us to take rehabilitation at home to the next level, and maybe would have benefits over rehabilitation in a in, uh, patient setting. So telemedicine holds a huge amount of promise as we move forward in time. What would be the role of virtual reality and augmented reality in taking us to the next level to be able to perform medicine at home in a different environment? We're talking about the metaverse. We think this is where things will be going over the next few years. So we're in for so many surprises, advances in medicine. We're in for a transformation over the next decade. And it's up to institutions like Houston Methodist and like Sheba Medical Center and other leading institutions, uh, many of them work through the ARC global ecosystem to try and find out the right mechanisms to put this to use, the right protocols, the right work streams. How do we work this in the proper way that will allow us to maximize health, maximize value to our patients at a minimum cost? So these are some of the challenges. There's going to be need for a huge amount of evidence, which is up to us to produce, so that we're able to take virtual care and telemedicine to the next level. I hope we'll be um, standing up to this uh, huge challenge. I sincerely think we will. And it's again up to us to make these next steps be very valuable to our patients. So I want to congratulate everyone on the work that they're doing. And I want to also say, Let's enjoy this seminar and let's use this seminar to grow and to continue to collaborate around this very, very important topic. Thank you very much. Hello. <clears throat> Very happy to be here. So we live in an era where we deliver healthcare beyond the boundaries of space and time. And the beauty really of telemedicine is its ability to transgress the many barriers that we as mankind have erected. Geographic, time, social, cultural, and even political. And it has really the potential to achieve healthcare support for anyone, anytime, and anywhere. But what is the true value of telemedicine to me? So actually I see it as three major components. The first one and the most obvious one is real-time virtual visits. 
Uh, for me, it, uh, video visits is much better and it gives us much more value. And really it's about connecting a clinician to a patient. But today, when we have the opportunity, we have the ability to monitor patients remotely in their home and to get actual, actual data about what happens with them between the physical encounters or the virtual encounters, give us a lot of value because it allows us to take objective data about our patients and to allow a true continuity of care for us. And the third thing that I wanna say is that the ability to uh, perform store and forward visits, to make asynchronous visits, give us, gives us a lot of flexibility and it allows even a physician in Houston to treat a patient in Israel, even when they're in a different time zone. So these are the major values that I see in telemedicine. And for decades now, uh, health organizations throughout the world and in Shiva as well, have tried to develop uh, services that are based on telehealth or telemedicine. However, although we had, uh, made, we've made a lot of efforts, we still weren't able to uh, make it become the mainstream of medicine. Telemedicine did not become medicine. And that of course is because we had many challenges in, in, in um, starting these uh, programs or, or services. Of course, there are technological uh, uh, problems. Uh, we have financial barriers and reimbursement uh, problems. We have regulatory and privacy issues and ethical issues as well. We also have to make sure there's accessibility to internet and, and to, to these services to everyone. But I think the major barriers for telemedicine to become medicine was the transformation that we as clinicians uh, and patients as well had to undergo in order to uh, accept virtual visits as equal or, or, or uh, uh, to, to, to be equal to uh, formal face-to-face uh, -face visits. So um, these were the barriers. And for us, the turning point really began in February, 2020. At that time, uh, we already heard about COVID-19 that began in China and spread already to different countries in the world. And there was this ship, the Diamond uh, Princess cruise ship, uh, which was uh, next to Japan, but on, this, on the board of this ship were about 15 Israelis. And uh, although they tried really hard measures to isolate these patients, COVID-19 spread there and there were hundreds of people infected with it. And on February 17, the Israeli government decided to bring these Israelis back to Israel and it was decided that Sheba will host them in an isolation ward that it will create. And I got the mission to try to make for them a model in which we will provide the best medical care that we know how to provide using telemedicine tools, this time in order to uh, decrease to the minimum the physical encounters with them in order to protect the staff. So I knew that we had to make a good video communication with them. We wanted to uh, monitor them and even be able to perform physical examination. And after we consulted Israeli companies, uh, startup companies uh, that we knew were doing telemedicine, but we were still not working with them, we came up with this solution. We inflated a, a tent that usually serves us as a field hospital tent outside of this facility and within the ward, we left some uh, different technologies and we wanted to do all our medical work from outside the, uh, uh, in this tent. We, we, we left there the physicians, you can see Professor Segal uh, doing physical examination, monitoring them, communicating with them and doing all the medical things he needed to do. Uh, and this allowed us for the first time to try and use it as a sandbox for many, many new technologies that we're, we're not using uh, yet. We did the same trick when we had to open our OBGYN COVID-19 ward for pregnant women with COVID-19. We again used some new technologies. As you can see here on the slide, we this portable uh, ultrasound that can connect to your phone and can be guided from afar by a physician. We use these technologies inside the ward to get experience with them and to get some, to, to be sure that they work. And nowadays we're using these technologies for patients 
that are outside of the hospital and staying at home instead of having to come to the uh, hospital. So once we did that, we also uh, transformed very quickly during that first wave of COVID-19, our outpatient clinic to virtual clinics. And this allowed us uh, to also con continue to take care of our patients, although they were in their homes uh, uh, while there was lockdown. And it also allowed some of our physicians that had to be in isolation and in lockdown to work from their home. We finished 2020 with more than 50,000 virtual visits in our outpatient clinics, comparing to a few hundreds in the year before that. So we finished the first wave of, of, of COVID-19 and experienced some new technologies, and we came up with some insights. We understood that not only did we have the chance to experience and try new technologies that we knew now that we're working and we can scale with, we, we, could, also, we, we could also use <clears throat> uh, these technologies for bigger things. We saw that the world has changed and the, there was a paradigm shift and we decided to challenge the term of a hospital. We no longer <clears throat> uh, treat a hospital as a house for sick people, or as we in Shiva like to say, a city of health that interacts with the community and the ecosystem. We can now provide care to everyone and everywhere. And that's when we decided to establish the first virtual hospital that we decided to call Shiva Beyond to really enable top quality Shiva top 10 hospital medical care for anyone, anytime, and anywhere. So this is what we did for the last year and a half. We rely on our most uh, important asset, which is Shiba's leading clinicians and know-how. To this, we add cutting edge technologies. And together we take these two things and in Shiba Beyond, what we know how to do is to create new models of care delivery and transform that to a service that can be operated and scaled up. So during 2029, 2021, which was the first year, we did a lot of things. We opened new services, we acquired services, we created uh, co collaboration with HMOs, with academic institutes. We did a lot of uh, activities and then it was decided that Shiba Beyond will actually become Shiba's fifth hospital. Shiba is a, a large center having four operating hospitals. And we will operate now as a truly hospital, a uh, true hospital from Shiba Beyond. We are opening new wards, a psychiatric ward, an OBGYN ward, a, 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 um, a rehabilitation ward, a pediatric ward, and an internal medicine ward. And these will operate as a true hospital in collaboration with Shiba's uh, wards and hospitals. So we finished 2021 with a lot of activities. We have um, right now, more than 400 patients enrolled in our programs monthly and more than 4,000 visits every month in our outpatients clinic. We really did uh, a breakthrough. But the last thing I want to talk to you about is how we took it even one step forward. Uh, uh, we, again, we uh, took advantage of a, new, uh, of a new humanitarian crisis, the Ukrainian war, and we uh, so we, we um, took uh, is, it as an opportunity to see how we can endorse these technologies and our new models of care into this new situation. So Israel decided to open in Ukraine uh, a field hospital. And in this field hospital, we opened a Shiva Beyond tent. And actually what we did, we did it in, in Shiva Beyond, in this Shiva Beyond tent, we reinforced uh, this hospital. We opened there uh, a clinic, an outpatient clinic, a consultation clinic, uh, in which we brought the best of Shiva's expert to consult these patients. We offered them at a hope operation in which uh, patients will bring their documents. We translated them. We uploaded their imaging and got them seen by Shiva's uh, imaging specialist. And then we put on our uh, most special, specialized specialist uh, to consult these patients who were uh, suffering during these war times. The other things what we did in this hospital, uh, field hospital, is bringing more technologies to reinforce the hospital itself. 
We brought their uh, um, cutting edge ultrasound point of care that helped them get some new imaging and other stuff. And in this picture, you can see how we use the VR, uh, VR glasses, VR lenses to treat anxiety uh, kids with, uh, with, with, uh, with these uh, VR glasses. And it was really helpful. Uh, on the left side, you can see what we did as well. We uh, tried to reinforce the, the, the local clinicians uh, with the help of, um, of the joint, the JDC, that provided us with some of these devices to leave behind to the Ukrainian physicians. We train, we use this uh, Beyond Tent to train new physicians about how to use telemedicine technologies in their services. And I think we brought them a lot of help. So again, we use a crisis. We, we took advantage of a crisis to take one step forward uh, our, our capabilities. And I think uh, that what we did he here in, in uh, the Ukrainian war in Shiva's Field Hospital is really to change the paradigm of what humanitarian aid will be in the future. You can bring biotechnology uh, more specialists, more power, more data to reinforce uh, the, the way we can help uh, these people in need. Just before I finish, I want to say that technology will always go one step forward. We'll never be able to reach a pace in which technology is advancing and provide us new tools that we can use. We'll never reach that pace. We as a medical, especially medical staff, are always a little bit behind. But we will always, with the help of uh, our, our innovation hub, we're doing a lot of efforts to reach this. And it always raises the question, will the technology uh, uh, do harm to the physician-patient relationship in the future? And I think it's just the opposite. We will be able in the future to use technologies to bring us physicians and clinicians closer to the houses of these patients and bring better care to these patients at home. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Sarah Fletcher. I'm just here to share a few remarks with you. That was a really inspiring um, presentation where you got to see all sorts of examples of the power and possibility um, that comes with these virtual and innovative technologies. At Houston Methodist as well, we leverage uh, a dizzying array of technologies to respond to the pandemic, but even before in order to optimize access and patient experience, um, to ensure that we retain the highest levels of safety and quality really across the whole continuum of care and continue to look ahead to how we can incorporate these technologies in our progression. I think we are really at a turning point, right? Um, telemedicine, virtual technologies, monitoring technologies, they're not new. They've been around for years. Uh, but with the help of the pandemic, as well as a number of other factors convening at the same time, we have this opportunity to really look at redefining care. And I think we're seeing that the narrative has shifted. When you start to listen to what patients and their providers and health systems say about these technologies, they're no longer saying it's not good enough. Um, they're no longer saying it's better than nothing, as we heard from a lot of physicians who reluctantly became telemedicine providers during the pandemic. We're starting to hear more and more, you know, in a lot of cases, this might be better. This might be best. I won't go back. Um, you know, I have to have this as part of my practice. Health systems are realizing this isn't just um, a necessity of a pandemic. This is an opportunity for them to provide better care, to load level, to recruit a different workforce, to reach patients for, for further and farther away. And employers, payers, regulators, they're also realizing the opportunity in advancing a higher quality care um, that's more convenient to their employees and patients, but also at the opportunity for lower cost points. And one thing just to add about the technology, because you're going to hear a lot today about the power of the technology, and it's moving at warp speed. It's getting smaller, cheaper, better, faster, more capabilities, smarter, um, more rules engines, more artificial analytics. 
Um, and yes, we've got lots of technologies that allow us to connect clinical teams to their patients. But what's important is not just the tip of the iceberg, but everything underneath the workflows, the communication, the protocols, the care model um, that has to be reinvented around leveraging these technologies so that patients get a coordinated care experience, even as we're disrupting the models that we've relied upon for generations that have preceded this one. And fortunately, we can look to several other industries for inspiration. Um, you know, many industries had very successful models um, you know, but if you miss the opportunity to delay adapting, um, you do so at your peril. And we think of the taxi industry and Blockbuster and your local bookstores and the way that we used to buy music or book a hotel. Um, and even loyal customers won't hang around forever if those care model deliveries, if those services are no longer meeting their needs. Um, and so you see an emergence of companies and industries that recognized they needed to seize opportunities to innovate, to disrupt, to change, even from a model that was successful for them, to embrace doing things a little bit differently. And the goal with all of this, of course, is achieving connected care with the patient at the center, leveraging these technologies and data but moving between care settings, um, but also moving between acuity settings. And we can transcend so many of those barriers that patients have to healthcare, geography, time zone, um, mobility, transportation. Um, but in some cases, the biggest barriers are, are our own, um, our, our own inability to get out of our own way when it comes to delivering the care that we know patients want. The great news is that it turns out that access to healthcare is truly good for all stakeholders. Um, it offers better outcomes for patients, more convenience, and tends to have a lower cost point and be more accessible. So in embracing the technologies, but recognizing that it's often not the technology, it's the relationships and the workflows, um, and seeing how quickly we're changing it couldn't be a more exciting time in healthcare to look ahead and see how we can leverage this pandemic experience to take those learnings and redefine a new healthcare experience in the future. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, and thank you very much for uh, the opportunity in presenting uh, to this uh, very uh, honorable uh, symposium. I will be speaking about uh, challenges and opportunities in physical examination at home. I am serving currently as the head of internal telemedicine department in Shiva uh, Beyond, Shiva's uh, virtual hospital that uh, Galia uh, already spoke about. And opportunities, opportunities, and uh, as Dr. Seuss says, all the places you go. Uh, on February uh, 2020, I went to the uh, teletent, to the to, uh, to get the first Israelis suspected of uh, carrying the COVID-19 to be virus. And we were convinced that this is going to be a lethal infection like Ebola. So we've built the teletent and this was my first experience using uh, telemedicine and my first experience starting to execute physical examination by a telecommunication. I was using several platforms back then and looking inside their throats. I, I don't know what did I look for, but uh, presumably uh, pharyngitis. And this was, this was the first uh, opportunity that we've started trying to characterize the clinical picture of COVID-19 uh, in Israel. Opportunities. Later on, uh, we have executed telemedicine and remote physical examination in uh, hospital at home uh, scenarios. And I see an opportunity in the fact that I'm getting with the nurses once again, because in my internal medicine department in hospital, sadly, I must confess that my uh, association with the nurses is very faint. There is no um, alignment any longer between the physician round and the nurses round. 
but in tele there is and the nurses are calling me to go on live with the patients they are helping me with challenges uh, in physical examination but this scenario of getting with the nurses i can see it as an opportunity much more than a challenge another opportunity is the fact that i have a chance using highly advanced physiological follow-up of my patients in our uh, general department internal medicine department i can only dream having physiologic uh, data streaming out of my patients i can only dream about uh, trying to um, contemplate a score for deterioration prediction of patients but currently although the score is not there yet the streaming of data is and the streaming of data is much more complex at times i must say redundant as you can see these physiological i don't really uh, want to know the cardiac index of each and every uh, patient but i can choose and this is an extremely good opportunity that i'm having doing physical examination and remote telemonitoring uh, we are doing um, currently a large volume of telemedicine and uh, of uh, COVID-19 patients at home. And this is a data uh, very characteristic uh, screen in which you can see the streaming of data saturation and pulse. And I want to tell you that the, the patients are doing their uh, vital signs by themselves. It is still not transmitting. And they are uh, entering it into the DATOS uh, application. You can see how bored the COVID-19, the isolated COVID-19 patients are because they are taking vitals at a much, much higher rate than expected. And once again, I have an opportunity of defining and characterizing both uh, the path of deterioration and the path of healing from COVID and I can speak only about patterns of deterioration and healing in DATOS vital signs for hours, but I got only 10 minutes uh, total, so I'll go on. Challenges, palpable versus non-palpable. When you see purpura, when you see signs of inflammation, you want to see the, the rubor, I can see. The dolor, I can ask. The calor, I need to touch. Many times I want the patients to describe. As I said earlier, I'm getting with the nurses. I ask the nurse, is this painful? Is this warm? Is this uh, a domatus? And therefore the challenge is uh, evident, but I, I must tell you that I find no obstacles in establishing the correct diagnosis and administrating the treatment. And at times, the physical examination is very critical. This is a young patient, patient that called me from New York, an Israeli young patient calling from New York, uh, three weeks post-COVID. And you can see the red lips. And I'm consulting his mother regarding his physical sign of red lips. And suddenly she says, oh, correct. Th these are new red lips. And he had a variant of PIMS. So, the opportunities are balanced with the challenges and I'm learning day and day and again uh, how to do it better from uh, day to day. You can look at the rashes, you can look at the urine, both in the urine within the tube or urine within the bag. As we stand by the patient's bed and look at them and speak with them and palpate and uh, I cannot smell yet, but I must say that this is considered as an advantage uh, currently. I don't want anyone to develop a module that will enable me to smell. I pass. This is a picture from uh, the field hospital from the Ukraine, in which a patient with uh, cirrhosis was examined and the jugular vein uh, congestion was uh, crying uh, all the way to Israel. Once again, a very, very good uh, physical examination, a very good opportunity to uh, uh, check the patient, 
alongside with the, in this case, a physician that was in the tent, Dr. Barkay. And uh, I think that we did a very good job uh, here uh, also. I'm using Taito as my uh, stethoscope. Uh, I am healing the lungs. I'm escalating, escalating to the heart. And I must tell you, it is in much, much better and much, much higher uh, quality than my uh, Littmann II uh, stethoscope. Uh, I have an opportunity of, uh, moreover, recording all my physical examination. When I record my physical examination, I can hear it once again later on. I can uh, ask uh, my colleagues uh, what is their opinion. These are things that I didn't have any chance using my stethoscope. And this is concerning the lung auscultation and the heart. And this patient, I can go back to his heart, to his lungs, to see his uh, pedal edema. This patient uh, is a, a COVID, patient, COVID patient, and you can see his chest x-ray. I am combining to my teleposition a, a whole myriad of uh, data, which gives the patient the notion and they feel it, that they are being treated extremely uh, comprehensive and all of that uh, being delivered when they are uh, staying at their convenience of their home. We are publishing now uh, the findings of over 250 first examinations that we executed with COVID-19. We did a qualitative a comparison to the legend uh, uh, tools, and we found out that the more uh, experienced physicians did appreciate better the, the, uh, the remote auscultation. And uh, since this was still uh, a, a small group, we used not only the p-value, but the effect size, d coins uh, factor. So, I can say that there are challenges, there are opportunities in physical examination at home, but considering the fact that we are going and developing the technologies, I'm very, very uh, optimistic. I thank you very much for uh, listening. And I remembered to stop sharing. Well, thank you, Dr. Siegel, for that wonderful presentation and all the work that you and your teams have done during COVID. Um, you know, as Houston Methodist embarked on this journey, um, there were quite a few assumptions that were made when looking at adding a peripheral device into our environment. On the patient's perspective, we wanted to make sure that the device itself was convenient and really had an augmented virtual experience and could potentially reduce the cost for healthcare. On the provider side, we knew we needed a device that offered a more extensive physical examination during the virtual visit. And this would allow our providers to be able to essentially diagnose better, as well as potentially treat patients with higher level of acuity. So we looked at a, a number of devices and we went with a standalone device that had advanced technology on it, which included a camera. Um, the otoscope and the tongue depressor allowed our providers to actually see down the patient's ear canal as well as their throat. And we took this device and we placed it into really three different environments. Our first pilot was done with a set of um, employees and we wanted to know if we could actually reduce ED utilization. So we deployed 116 devices and within about 12 months we saw 20 visits. Um, some of the findings were that the technology that actually enjoyed, but as you can see, utilization was pretty low. And I think that was due to the low acuity types of care that were coming through our virtual visits. Um, we also experienced that the device itself um, really was um, better use with um, our children population, not necessarily in our adult population. We then placed the device in one of our primary care offices and we really wanted to evaluate the use of this device in a more synchronized workflow to really be able to see how it worked well with our MyChart video visits. We deployed 90 devices and within six months, we saw about four visits. So again, very low utilization. Um, our findings in that was a little different. Um, patients really had difficulty pairing the device in advance with Wi-Fi. 
Um, and also sometimes patients weren't near their device. So let's say the device was at home and maybe they had their visit being performed elsewhere. Staff also, also had to remember that uh, which patients had the device in order to really schedule them in a very specific visit type for that synchronized workflow to work appropriately. Providers did feel like it added value to the visit, but wasn't necessarily needed to diagnose their patients. And they also experienced some audio challenges, which really prevented them from using the device. In the last environment, we placed it with our consumers. And these were patients that were actually presenting into our virtual urgent care platform. Uh, we deployed 82 devices. And within about 18 months, we saw 20 visits. Uh, the patients thought that the device itself, it was convenient experience to use um, when they were able to use it. They would recommend it to others. Very similar um, feedback on it being more kid-friendly, not necessarily needed in the adult population. And there was concerns about the high price point and the difficulty with pairing the device to Wi-Fi. I'm gonna be handing this off to Dr. Rachel Bishop. She is our medical director for virtual urgent care. And she'll be talking about some of our clinical lessons learned during this pilot. Dr. Bishop. Thank you so much, Arisha. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on our clinical um, uh, experiences with uh, peripheral devices through virtual urgent care. Um, we had initially believed that um, using the peripheral devices was going to actually expand our scope of care and enable us to um, see a higher level of care, um, expand the scope of the, the types of patients we were able to see, and, um, and to, to be able to really um, see more patients. However, uh, given um, that we are in a virtual urgent care setting, and we are seeing um, urgent but not emergent uh, patients most of the time that were fairly uh, simple. We actually um, found that um, although you know, it was a kind of a, um, a quote unquote neat device to have, um, we did find with the exception of potentially using otoscope that most of our patients were really able to be seen, diagnosed and treated simply using um, a good um, history and um, basic um, visual exam that we were able to perform without peripheral devices. Um, the one exception to that was really um, the potential of using a scopic exam since we, um, through our clinical guidelines, we really feel, um, I personally feel that for um, ear uh, complaints, ear pain, a potential uh, TM ruptures, et cetera, um, otoscopic evaluation truly is needed to um, be able to see and evaluate patients with significant ear complaints. Um, however, we did feel that um, the uh, otoscopic um, exam was not always um, a quality that we were able to um, use this and progress. Um, patients we also felt were um, going to be able to be better triaged and evaluated through the stethoscope. However, um, we found that many of these patients who came in and did require a lung exam, a cardiac exam, were sicker, and therefore, because it was an urgent care setting, still needed that higher level of care, regardless of the fact if we had the um, stethoscope exam um, or not. Um, we also found that we had issues with quality of exams through the peripherals. I know that it's very um, a different experience to what Dr. Siegel just uh, expressed. However, we felt that um, we were able to hear um, heart sounds very well. They weren't of desire uh, quality and neither were lung sounds. And we also had a lot of um, patients have difficulty with user error actually being able to obtain those quality exams. Um, as Arisha mentioned, um, we had patients who really felt that the, per the purchase of the uh, peripheral device was not cost effective. They had technical difficulties with pairing and using the Bluetooth technology. And they also had technical difficulties utilizing device despite the um, very comprehensive um, videos and training videos that they were trying to utilize. Um, what we did find um, 
especially through COVID, um, that was a much better technology that um, was able to be used was actually smart watches. Um, mostly because we found patients were continuously monitoring their pulses. They were able to continuously monitor their pulse oximetry throughout the day, um, especially in those COVID patients who were worried and wanting them to, to monitor their oxygen saturation. And also in patients who maybe were experiencing palpitations or cardiac symptoms, they were able to pull an on-demand EKG. And I have found that the ECG uh, quality is actually fairly good. Um, specifically with Apple uh, watches. Um, our patients felt, feel that these devices are much more consumer friendly, they're easier to use, um, and they're multifunctional from the standpoint of being a watch and all their other apps in addition to these um, uh, peripheral health um, functionalities. Um, and therefore many patients felt that it was much more cost effective and um, they were much more likely to to purchase and or use these devices. Um, and as I mentioned, we found this specifically helpful during COVID um, in patients that we wanted them to monitor their O2 sats. They didn't have prior lung disease and maybe didn't have a pulse oximeter already at home or were finding them difficult to, to find, but they had their Apple Watch already um, and didn't realize that it had that capability. Um, it's also very helpful in our asthmatics who are maybe having an upper respiratory infection and also um, we would like to know their oxygen saturation. And patients who have gastroenteritis um, and have potential dehydration, it's very nice to be able to monitor, um, be able to get them to capture a, a pulse. A nice slide, uh, next slide please. Um, so in, in, to summarize, um, we really felt that peripheral de uh, devices were really kind of a neat technology, but maybe not um, of the quality that we felt and um, we could utilize thoroughly to further evaluate a, a greater scope of care within our urgent care population. And we really felt that there was a, a um, kind of a Zen diagram of a circle diagram where certain characteristics really needed to overlap from the clinical patient provider standpoint and come together in just the right way for them to be really worth our while and useful for us. Um, thank you very much for your attention and your time. And we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, Dr. Bishop, uh, Irisha, and Professor Sega. Thank you for your inspiring uh, uh, talks. Um, you talked a lot, uh, uh, Irisha and Dr. Rachel, about the difficulties you have, the technical problems, uh, and um, I want. I wondered uh, how did you deal with these problems? Did you have any? Uh, operating technical support team to support you with these things. And how, and, and another question uh, next for the three of you, how do you see the future of physical examination and device utilization? Uh, for example, in, in five years, are you examining new tools? Are you, do you have a pipeline of new tools that you're trying and uh, looking forward to use? Irisha. Yeah, I can answer the first question. I'll let Dr. Bishop answer the second. So from an IT um, standpoint, we had a number of wonderful IT uh, analysts on board that really helped us with some of our technical challenges. Uh, but keep in mind the, the challenges that we were experiencing many times were on the patient's um, side. And so we actually had to um, many times have kind of uh, a virtual calls to try to walk through some of those challenges between our IT team as well as the vendor's IT team. So there was a number of, of resources that really helped us through those challenges, uh, but many times we weren't able to kind of proceed with that visit just because of, of time uh, and the provider's time and the patient's time. So we essentially had to um, try to kind of solve the problem offline. Yeah, and from a clinical standpoint, quite honestly, we just kind of went and proceeded with the visit without any sort of peripherals. And, you know, I, I will say in, in our kind of in the urgent care population that we're seeing where they're, you know, acute but not um, e emergent type problems. Um, and, we, you know, obviously I'm not seeing primary care on a regular basis where I can kind of coach and spend a lot of time coaching patients. Um, most of the time, a lot of our um, diagnosis and treatment really is HPI mediated. So really good history um, it, it is 
I find to be 90% of what, what I'm doing when I'm seeing a virtual urgent care patient. And then the last little bit, I can really somewhat depend upon just a general visualization of the patient's health and wellness. Um, I can almost always get a good look at the posterior or pharynx, um, you know, conjunctiva. And, you know, like I said, uh, they're really the only significant like uh, factors that might be missing is patients who have ear pain or ear complaints solely where we can't do an otoscopic exam and then we would need to refer them in. But even a lot of patients who have ear complaints, it's related to a general upper respiratory infection. So you just treat the, and it's not, you know, most of it's viral. So it's, it, does it change our outcome it's all that much? And so we just started treating without it, basically. And, and, and that raises the question of antibiotic overuse. And um, my ID physician is speaking out now. <laughs> we don't, we don't. And that's the whole thing is, as I put a very high um, a burden on my, my APP team and myself on antibiotic stewardship. So Correct. They're viral, and we're not treating them. With, we're treating them symptomatically, um, as yeah. they should be. Even even if they were seen in the office and have a little red ear, it's mostly viral yeah. anyhow. So yeah, yeah. So I do see a lot of challenges in treating acute patients uh, where you don't have a lot of time to train them in advance and to show them the technologies. We we definitely use more uh, these uh, remote care, remote monitoring uh, devices. And sometimes the physical examination devices on more chronic patients. Uh, Gadi, can you tell us about your experience and your difficulties in using these, uh, these, this equipment and, uh, and how did you uh, tackle these problems? As always, difficulties are only with humans, not with technology. Technology is a temporary obstacle only. Technology is a temporary obstacle. If you would have asked me when I had the Nokia uh, shell telephone, you remember the Nokia phones? <laughs> uh, whether I can speak with, uh, in video with someone, I would think that you're crazy. I, I didn't imagine it. By the way, Nokia also did not. So I, I, I'm quite certain that technology will proceed. The problem is with, with humans, the internal medicine uh, acts towards the physical examination like a, a very sacred something, a very sh a shrine. And I think that Rachel is extremely correct. Through good history, we always tell the students it's 90% of diagnosis. Bullshit. I was sure you would agree with Bullshit. this. It, it is 99% of diagnosis. It's only a question of how, how long do you have the patient to hear them blah, 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 once again. So, and the I must admit also, because I think that it is a very intimate surrounding, no one hears us. I use the stethoscope many times in order to not disappoint the patient because the patient waits for someone to hear his heart. Now, everyone knows that COVID-19 doesn't sound, doesn't make any sound. It does not make any sound above the lungs, not bronchospasm, not crepitus, nothing but I still hear their lungs with the title because they await. They will find themselves disadvantaged compared to the fellows that are sitting four hours in the waiting room. I'm coming to their home. But so I think that the technology will advance. I think that the, 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 the sensors will become much more sophisticated that I can even imagine now. And the main and the technology will be less important. The main issue is the ability to deliver high, very high quality uh, uh, medicine at home. This is the instead of uh, going and expanding our nosocomial uh, surroundings. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, this inspiring uh, these inspiring lectures and discussion. Uh, we'll have a five minutes break and then please join us for the international collaboration and innovation panel discussion and you're uh, free to ask questions in the chat if you want and then we'll try to answer them afterwards thank you
my passion has been around enabling digital technology to support patient engagement, to support clinician, cl clinical efficiencies, um, and to really create a, a 10x change uh, within the organization. Hi, my name is Karen Biala. I'm the Director of International Partnerships at Shiva Medical Center's innovation arm known as ARC. And I have the honor of serving on a panel with several esteemed guests here that we have today. And I'll first um, tell you who they are and then let them introduce themselves. So we have Josh Soule, the Administrative Director of Innovation and Clinical Ambulatory S Systems from Houston Methodist, Murat Earl Khan, the Director of Innovation at Houston Methodist and Professor Ayal Simlichman, our Chief Transformation and Innovation Officer here at Sheba Medical Center, uh, also the co-founder of ARC. So Josh, if you can start us off uh, with a brief opening, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and set the stage for us, and then we'll hand it on to the other panelists before we move forward. Yeah, thanks, Karen. So as Karen mentioned, my name is Josh Soule. I am an administrative director at Houston Methodist for innovation and clinical and ambulatory systems. Um, I think, you know, primarily my focus has been on enabling digital technology for patients um, to create greater engagement, as well as to create clinical efficiencies uh, to support our clinicians uh, supporting and treating those patients. Um, our goal at the Center for Innovation is create a, a, to create a 10x change within the organization and truly provide uh, digital transformation. And now on to you, Murat. Of course, I'll have to unmute. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this, is, this is such a great pleasure and honor to, uh, to be uh, doing this uh, joint, uh, joint panel and joint event with uh, Chiba uh, and, and Houston Methodist. Uh, my name is Murat Ralkan. I'm the Director of Innovation for the Houston Methodist Center for Innovation. As Josh, Josh explained, Center for Innovation uh, focuses on major transformations, major, major uh, change uh, in our organization. We focus primarily on digital technologies, and my goal is to both help and drive strategy, but also into day-to-day -to, -day to help with the implementation and make sure that we have traction um, for those. Um, Back to you, Karen. Great. Now we'll move on to Ayal. Hi, and uh, thank you for inviting me to join this uh, panel um, and this uh, very important event, I think, uh, showcasing what collaboration needs to look like. And um, um, at Chiba Medical Center, we've started our ARC um, innovation platform about uh, three years ago, just uh, before COVID. And uh, the idea with ARC is that we're looking to redesign healthcare uh, and do that on a global level, um, not just locally at Chiba. And to do that, um, obviously digital health is a cornerstone. We all understand that digital health is the main transformation vehicle over the next decade at least, uh, as healthcare uh, will be transformed through digital health uh, in many ways. Um, so that's our focus at ARC, although we still do a lot of innovation on medical device and pharma and diagnostics. But for sure, the focus uh, um, has become digital health and also building our international uh, um, collaborators um, and partners uh, like Houston Methodist, because we think that um, it's not enough just to, um, you know, think about our own problems and try to figure out solutions to that. We need to think uh, broad, broader. We need to think globally. We need to work with partners that can complement uh, what we lack and also we need to be able to uh, implement on a larger scale. And that's exactly what we're looking to do, uh, run implementations, not just uh, in one site, but do multiple sites if we can, learn from each other, um, you know, learn the best practices and also what uh, errors not to repeat. We think that's a big part of, uh, of collaboration. Thank you all. Um, now we'll move on to focusing a little bit on the future. One thing that uh, the pandemic demonstrated for us was that in terms of collaboration, we no longer have the same boundaries, right? Because we can be in touch through Zoom and we can do a lot more even if we're in different places. So uh, Josh, start us off with how do you see 
the future of collaborating uh, together with different partners from different parts of the globe evolving as we move forward. I think you can see the power of the collaboration right now. I mean, we are on Zoom with a group, a prestigious group in Israel. It's amazing stuff. I mean, it's pretty awesome that we're able to do this right now. Now, did the pandemic force that to happen? Um, it, it could have. Yeah, I think the silver lining in this awful pandemic that has taken uh, over the world is that it did leapfrog innovation in healthcare by 10 years. Uh, we're seeing adoption of technology happening across our system. Uh, we're looking at collaborations and discussions uh, across the U.S. with different innovative uh, groups to see how we can solve issues um, that someone in Florida may be having or someone in California may be having. Um, we, we do share uh, quite a bit uh, to make sure that we are, again, putting the patient in the center of what we do and ensuring that our physicians and clinicians uh, get the most efficient technologies that are out there as they're on the front lines treating the patients uh, during that pandemic. Uh, what about you, Marat? How do you see the future for collaboration? I think one of the things that um, I, mean, I, I agree with everything that Josh has been um, explaining, Josh has been saying, I think it shows us pandemic, unfortunately, um, showed us a way that there's a different way uh, to collaborate, there's a different way to work, there's a different way to uh, provide care. But I think we now know that it is not as bad uh, to be on Zoom, to do, to do work, to, uh, to provide clinical care. So I think it eliminated some of, the, some of the fears that would have taken a much longer time. But I think one of the other things that's, uh, what, it, what that's starting is sort of this globalization of knowledge and globalization of um, maybe care delivery as well. So if a software company can be in, um, in three different um, states, three different countries, three different time zones, maybe, maybe the future of healthcare in, in the hospital as we kind of understand could be in different time zones. We could, I mean, virtual, um, ICU is, is a great example of that. It's actually better to be in a different time zone to provide that uh, care uh, because at one place it could be night, the other place will be, uh, will be during the day and you could be providing care uh, with the clinical coverage. Um, I think it, the hospital and the organization of the hospital as we understand will, will change uh, over time. It will probably take a lot of time uh, but at least this was sort of the kickstart for that. Hey, all I want to give you the opportunity to add your thoughts and how you see see things. Sure. So you know, it's not by chance that uh, the C in ARC uh, stands for collaboration. Um, you know, we think that uh, collaboration is critical because it allows us to create added value. We all know we live in a resource restricted uh, uh, environment in healthcare. Um, and we're trying to make the most of what we have. And in doing that, the ability to collaborate um, offers that possibility. If uh, I always say that if uh, through collaboration, we end up uh, with just a sum of what we bring to the table, then we're missing something. If we're able to create access and added value on top of that, that's what uh, is needed. And specifically, when we speak about uh, virtual care or telemedicine, um, it's, um, you know, there's so many moving pieces in that field. I mean, there's the clinical protocols, uh, there's the technology that we're using. Um, can, you know, who can we uh, care for at the home and who do we need to bring to the hospital? There's so many different parts to this that, um, you know, sharing information and, and sharing, uh, again, best practices and evidence that we all generate um, can help us propel virtual care to the next level to allow us to um, you know, really use this medium in, in the right approach um, that would deliver a much more patient-centric care than what we're currently doing. We know that care at home is safer than care at the hospital. We know that it's probably costs less than care at the hospital, and we know it's much more patient-centered. So if we can move in that direction through the joint learnings that we each bring to the table uh, and do joint implementations where we, again, where we uh, share knowledge and experience I think that can be uh, instrumental in, in pushing virtual care forward. Wonderful. Thank you for that. 
And uh, Josh, I'm going to start again with you um, on the next question, which is uh, thinking about how uh, we've been working together for a while, Shiva Medical Center and Houston Methodist, but across the other partners that you have, what are some of the commonalities that help us take advantage of, of partnering? Um, and, and how do you see that uh, as we think about next steps, um, pushing us forward with collaborating and, and partnering? I think that's a great question. I, I, what I see coming through, in, at least into our, our Houston Methodist um, Innovation Center has been a tremendous amount of passion. Whether it's a group from the UK, Australia, Denmark, Israel, the passion is there around creating something new, focusing in on the art of the possible, what could happen in healthcare. And that, that I believe is, is really powerful. You can hear that I'm really passionate about uh, having passion in making change. Uh, the current delivery system is hard. Um, can't we make it easier? And so the power of collaboration, again, and I think IL said it really well, is, is leveraging best practices. What lessons did you learn trying to implement this strategy? And then how can we apply it in our own implementation? We might be able to save ourselves money. We might be able to save ourselves some grief. Um, and as, as we take lessons learned from other organizations, other countries, other uh, collaborators, um, and then really move forward in a way that is transformational. Uh, and transforming healthcare, I think, is really what we need right now. And we face a lot of consumerism. Amazon, Google, it's all at the fingertips of many of our patients. And healthcare should begin to move in that direction. And we won't be able to do that unless we are collaborating uh, in, on a global scale. Murat, any uh, other insights that you have before we move on to the next uh, question? Maybe very briefly want to build on something that Josh said, which is very important. I think uh, what we're seeing globally is, uh, is a convergence of experiences, right? You, you can have Uber in, uh, in Houston, you can have uh, Uber in, in Tel Aviv, uh, in Israel. Um, so, but what that provides is sort of the, this convenience, uh, convenience access and, and uh, basically the same level of experiences and, and globally those are converging. The reason I'm kind of, I'm giving this example is as we speak with our uh, international partners, whether they're from Israel, Ireland, UK, uh, Denmark, we're more or less trying to solve for the same problems. Of course, there are some differences because our healthcare infrastructure is uh, shaped differently, but at the pre-care, pre-hospital care is almost always the same that we're trying to be more convenient and easy for, uh, for our patients and customers globally. So I think uh, there's a lot to learn in between different, uh, different countries and different experiences, so. Thanks. Uh, and, and seeing that we have a short time left, I want to actually give AL the opportunity to give us a little bit of a call to action. What can we do today, the audience that is listening to us, what can each of us do to make partnerships work better? Well, you know, we, we, we've been practicing a lot of that and it's a major, Karen, as you know very well, it's a major uh, piece of what ARC is. Um, we've been trying to develop uh, methodologies that allow us to work better together and, and take advantage of, you know, of these types of collaborations. At the end of the day, we're, you know, we're much more similar than we think. Uh, we're faced with the same challenges. Um, you know, even if payment systems are different, um, at, at the end of the day, it's still that uh, heart failure patient at home that keeps bouncing back to the hospital, regardless of whether it's Denmark or, or Houston or UK or Israel or any place else. You know, physiology is just the same. And, uh, and how do we prevent that patient from bouncing, bouncing back? How do we uh, improve their quality of life? Uh, how do we focus on, on their needs? You know, that's uh, similar across different countries. So, um, you know, I urge us all to come together and, uh, and discuss this and, and, you know, bring different solutions to the table. Um, I think that just having this dialogue, whether it's virtual or physical, um, and you know, even with Zoom, it's still good to get together once in a while. Um, and we try to do that. We have the ARC Summit coming up uh, in June where we invite people to come here physically uh, so we can discuss things uh, physically and, and 
take collaboration to the next level. Um, so I, I think that at the end of the day, it's about sharing what we're doing. It's about working together, um, um, you know, finding what solutions have worked for each one of us um, and, and building a new future for healthcare that is basically built from whatever each of us have accomplished, uh, put into one uh, blueprint. Thank you so much, uh, Josh, Murat, and Eyal. Uh, this was really terrific. And uh, I think we're moving on to our next presentation. So I hope uh, the audience listening enjoys the rest of the symposium. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see if it starts. Okay. Uh, ready? It's good. Everyone sees it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Avivit Fuchs, I'm a psychiatrist uh, at uh, Sheba Tel Shomer Hospital. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this unique and interesting conference today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to tell you about the online psychiatric care program at Tel Shomer Hospital. Uh, the main... The main principles guiding our online hospitalization program are to offer a high level of care in the patient's home environment. Uh, our staff is available to the patients 24 seven. We prioritize continuity of care and reaching out. Uh, we don't wait for the patients to come to us. We are proactive as far as monitoring their symptoms, treatment, medication, et cetera. Um, the great thing about this is that we can very quickly detect when a patient um, is experiencing a worsening of their symptoms and we can help uh, prevent further decompensation. We can react quickly and make changes in their treatment and this prevents further decompensation. Additionally, uh, we offer treatment by a multidisciplinary team. Um, we enable monitoring of vital signs, meaning it's more than just the online conversation, but we have uh, additional tools to get a complete picture of the patient's status. The program has two components. The first is an intensive online hospitalization program. And the second part occurs when patients are transitioned over to an online outpatient or clinic program. Uh, the initial online hospitalization phase consists of three to five weeks where the patient receives daily monitoring by the nurse care manager and three times a week visits with a psychiatrist. And after this intensive hospitalization phase, they are transitioned to the clinic phase during which frequency of visits is gradually decreased to once monthly nurse visits and once monthly psychiatric monitoring. Of course, we have the flexibility to increase visits as needed. And during the clinic phase is when other services are added in, such as psychotherapy, occupational therapy, and meeting with a social worker, a nutritionist. Uh, patients remain in the clinic phase for a year, and there is an option to extend to a second year of treatments. Uh, so the technological platform that we use consists of several methods of communication. Uh, video, uh, we have synchronous communication, uh, video meetings and phone calls, as well as asynchronous communication, like text messages um, with staff and system messages sent automatically to the patient, and also uh, symptom rating questionnaires. The information is presented on a user-friendly dashboard to healthcare providers and to the patients. Patients are provided with instruments such as a smartwatch, blood pressure gauge, oxygen saturation monitor, 
and patients get a tablet for use during the program, or recently we've started giving patients the option to download the program onto their smartphone if they want. And we also provide a smart medication box. So our multidisciplinary team consists of a nurse care manager. She's really the most important person for the patient from day one. This is the nurse, um, the nurse care case manager is a daily contact with um, the patient, um, sometimes multiple times a day um, throughout the hospitalization phase. And then they continue to be in touch with the patient on a weekly to monthly basis uh, throughout the year or two years that they continue with our treatment. Um, there's a psychiatrist who meets with the patient three times a week uh, during the hospitalization phase. And then gradually uh, those visits decrease to about once a month during the clinic phase. We have a psychotherapist for individual uh, treatment. Uh, we're also working on developing group therapy uh, for patients in our program. Interestingly, we found that not everyone wants individual psychotherapy because they get so much other intensive treatment that sometimes they don't feel it's necessary. Um, and we also give patients the option to continue to work with an outside therapist if they already have one. Uh, we have a social worker who helps with community and social benefits. We have a nutritionist and an occupational therapist. Um, actually, the occupational therapist um, is a really nice example of the unique benefits of this online treatment model. Um, in the past, when meeting in an office, a patient might describe something that they have difficulty doing and they would work on it in theory with a the therapist. But now the OT specialist can really go out with the patient in the community. They just carry them along by phone and they can actually you know, do chores around the house, wash dishes together, go outside for exposure therapy to actually learn to cope with the anxiety that's getting in their way in real time in order to improve their functioning. Um, and of course, also part of our team is the great work, uh, the supportive administrative manager and the technical support members of our team. So who are our patients? Um, the program is intended for patients with significant mental illness requiring hospitalization that would be appropriate for an open or unlocked hospitalization unit. Um, the patients should not have active issues of uh, imminent danger to themselves or others, and they should not be actively abusing substances. Um, the patients need to be able to provide consent and they need to be willing and able to cooperate with treatment. Um, and there also needs to be a caregiver involved, uh, either living with the patient or nearby, but someone else in the community who can actually provide care and be a contact person in the community. Um, so we've been accepting patients since January 2020, even prior to the start of the COVID pandemic. And we've had 139 patients in our program. Uh, currently we have 61 active patients. Um, the, the age range is from 18 to 76. So basically adults um, with an average age of uh, 38.9. The diagnoses that we treat are primarily mood disorders and anxiety disorders, uh, as well as personality disorders and schizophrenia and uh, other psychotic disorders. Um, Uh, out of the 139 patients, 90 of them have never been hospitalized prior to coming to us. Um, during the course of their treatment with us, 13 have needed hospitalization in the inpatient unit. And over time, uh, 22 patients have dropped out of our treatment. Um, the dropped out number is an interesting place to pause in order to think about lessons learned from our experience in this treatment. It has definitely been a learning process um, for us, figuring out who is appropriate for the program and who isn't. Uh, the common re reasons for patients to drop out are basically poor initial screening. Um, uh, the patient uh, either needs a higher level of care or like an inpatient unit, or they need inpatient mo uh, in-person monitoring. Um, patients with active and prominent alcohol or substance abuse, um, which wasn't correctly identified initially, end up not working out in the program. And sometimes active paranoia has been an issue because the patient is just not able to feel comfortable uh, with the video platform. And this makes uh, assessment, alliance, and treatment very difficult. And so they uh, eventually drop out. 
Um, on the other hand, a subgroup of people who have, we have found to be uh, quite successful in our treatment is mothers, uh, because they often have the obstacle of not being able to easily leave their home for an extended time to be hospitalized for care. And in our program, they really can benefit from the intensive treatment and support while being available and present at home. Um, Regarding uh, patient satisfaction, we have active research work going on, but there are still no conclusive findings. Uh, some preliminary findings indicate that patients feel that the online hospitalization program is as good as a formal regular hospitalization. Um, and regarding uh, treatment alliance, our treatment is better than the regular standard of treatment. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from patients about this point. They really appreciate the continuity of care and the presence of support over the long term. Um, you can see here that our likely to recommend to others is uh, rating is high as is the general satisfaction in the program are uh, also high. Um, so what's in store for our program in the future? Um, we've learned that in addition to the advantages and convenience of um, offering online intensive psychiatric care to patients, through this technologically rich experience, we, we've, we collect an enormous amount of data. And so we've started thinking about how to take advantage of this data in order to develop personalized treatment for our patients. Uh, we're aiming to develop an AI, uh, artificial intelligence driven uh, system where over time, Patients can report on their symptoms and the system can generate personalized messages and recommendations for them, such as recommendations for healthy lifestyle choices like exercise or sleep hygiene guidance, uh, reminding them to take their medication or to handle skipped doses of medication or offering them skills like breathing exercises or targeted CBT skills. And this personalized information can really augment the work of the live clinicians. Um, and ultimately, these tools aim to empower the patients to, to help themselves and provide them with comprehensive, effective, and individualized treatment. Thank you. Yes, hello, I'm uh, Dr. Karina Keenman. I'm glad to have the opportunity to present to you on behalf of the Houston Methodist Telepsychiatry Team. During my talk today, I'll provide an overview of how telepsychiatry at Houston Methodist has evolved over time and discuss some of the key challenges faced in developing and maintaining telepsychiatry services. I'll also share some of the key lessons learned about managing a telepsychiatry vendor partnership. So on our next slide, um, I'll review the evolution and expansion of telepsychiatry at Houston Methodist. In stage one, um, the Houston Methodist system includes one 24-bed acute psychiatric unit that accepts patients with psychiatric emergencies 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In the past, psychiatry residents admitted patients when they arrived to the psychiatric unit in the overnight hours. Due to duty hour restrictions, we lost this overnight coverage. So telepsychiatry became the solution to this problem. So in stage one, Houston Methodist established a contract with the telepsychiatry vendor to admit patients to the psychiatric unit overnight. In stage two, the Houston Methodist emergency departments were experiencing increasing numbers of patients presenting with psychiatric complaints. It became clear the emergency department teams needed help with evaluating and managing psychiatry patients in order to ensure safe and timely patient care. We engaged with our vendor to offer emergency telepsychiatry services in the emergency departments throughout the system. Next, we have stage three. On the acute medical floors, there were increasing numbers of psychiatric patients um, being recognized as having comorbid psychiatric issues that were impacting their medical care. 
in these patients included patients being identified as high risk of suicide or aggressive behavior. So to support the medical teams, the telepsychiatry um, consultation services were expanded to acute medical floors when in-house consultation liaison psychiatrists were unavailable. Um, that brings us to our next slide, the current state of telepsychiatry at Houston Methodist. Uh, we have a contract with a telepsychiatry vendor that provides the majority of emergency and acute psychiatric services throughout the system. To date, over 20,000 telepsychiatry consults have been performed since 2018. Telepsychiatry services are fully operational at eight Houston Methodist sites. Telepsychiatry services are available essentially 24 seven on demand. Um, in 2020, Houston Methodist established the Department of Virtual Medicine to provide dedicated leadership and administrative support to help maximize the delivery of telepsychiatry services throughout the Houston Methodist system. For our next slide, um, challenges. It may come as a surprise that technological issues or issues with workflows have not been the main challenges we're facing at this time. The initial team assigned to set up the technology and the process flows did such an amazing job that at this point, the more pressing issues have been maintaining reasonable response times, quality of care and coordination of services. The global pandemic and resulting demand for behavioral health care put a severe strain on the available telepsychiatry resources. Comparing 2019 to 2021, there was a 141% increase in the number of telepsychiatry consults being requested. Just as the need for psychiatry services was increasing, our vendor partner began to have some difficulty with retaining and recruiting psychiatrists. Ultimately, this led to some intermittent gaps in provider availability and increasing response times that impacted the Houston Methodist system. One of the most significant ongoing challenges has been how to ensure that our vendor is providing quality care up to the Houston Methodist standard and consistent with Houston Methodist culture. The rapid expansion of telepsychiatry services quickly outpaced our ability to monitor the quality of each and every consult or even to do a random sampling of consults. So from the beginning, we were monitoring quality metrics, but some aspects of quality care and behavioral health are just not that easy to measure. This seems to be especially true when reviewing clinical decisions that don't have a clear right or wrong answer, such as prescribing medication choices. So um, as is so common in every other area of medicine, there was also the challenge of communication and coordination of care. We struggled with how to foster lines of communication between all of the various groups that were involved in delivering or utilizing the telepsychiatry services. So for example, we might note um, communication gaps between the primary team members taking care of the patient in-house and the telepsychiatrist or sometimes between our own internal um, primary treatment teams and the virtual medicine um, leadership team that could handle issues happening in real time. A lapse in communication at any level could potentially cause confusion or frustration and have the potential to impact patient care. Finally, we face the dilemma of how to create an overarching system level vision of telepsychiatry that would also be flexible enough to meet the specific needs of each Houston Methodist site. Adding to the challenge was that each hospital site in the system has its own unique needs, leadership, and culture. So for example, um, there's a particular hospital in the system that had a contract with the local psychiatry group that agreed to provide in-person consultation services at that one particular site. So then that site may have questions about how they could benefit from telepsychiatry or how to integrate virtual psychiatry into the menu of services they can already provide. As a second example, one of our Houston Methodist sites is in a different county that has different laws pertaining to the involuntary mental health treatment of patients. So patient care can, uh, issues can arise if the telepsychiatrist recommends an intervention that fails to take into account the specific county laws or the available local resources. So the main challenges have really been around maintaining responsiveness, high quality care um, that is well coordinated and meeting the particular needs of the system and its patients. Um, 
on the next slide, slide five, uh, we took a step back to really reflect on the journey we've been on over the past few years. And we thought about some key pieces of wisdom that we felt like we could offer to any group or organization looking to develop a telepsychiatry vendor partnership. We were able to identify three key factors or pillars that serve to support a healthy vendor relationship. Pillar number one is good communication. We look for ways to foster timely, routine, and transparent communication at all levels. The strategies we found helpful to facilitate good communication included scheduling biweekly meetings between the Houston Methodist telepsychiatry team and vendor leadership in order to share feedback or address and anticipate any issues. Um, also creating clinical positions within the virtual medicine department to act as liaisons between the virtual medicine team and the primary treatment teams utilizing the telepsychiatry services. This provided a mechanism for coordinating patient care between the telepsychiatrists and the in-house clinical teams and provided a way of addressing clinical issues in real time. Pillar number two is ensuring accountability. The goal is to create a system that really supports a high standard of care. Strategies for ensuring accountability included structuring the contract with the vendor in a way that incentivized quality care and including penalties whenever the care fell below a certain standard. Um, there was also a process or creating a process for review of complex cases and troubleshooting clinical issues in real time in order to decrease the risk of any unwanted patient outcomes. Um, we were also thoughtful about key quality metrics that you uh, want to track as part of your data dashboard. And we're also looking at diversifying the vendor portfolio by bringing on more than one vendor partner. Hopefully, hopefully this creates some healthy competition, um, decreases the risk of coverage gaps or delays in response times, and could provide an opportunity to try out different coverage models of telepsychiatry to see what works best for uh, each individual side or the system as a whole. And finally, pillar number three, setting clear expectations. On the front end, really thinking about the particular needs of your system and each site within your system. It's important to be as clear as possible about the services that you expect from the vendor. For example, if using telepsychiatrists as consultants on an acute medical floor, do you want the consultant to enter orders or just document recommendations? Will they be expected to complete the involuntary mental health documents or, or will that be designated to a different member of the team? Um, at times, of course, your expectations may be outside of the vendor's usual scope of services. And in those cases, you know, really determining if you can negotiate with the vendor to make an accommodation for your system or if you'll need to work within your system to delegate those responsibilities to other members of the treatment team. And finally, managing um, expectations within your system is equally as important. So taking the time to really educate your organization staff about what services they can expect and cannot expect from the vendor as a way to really prevent misunderstandings along the way. Um, so in closing over the past few years, we've seen the rapid expansion of telepsychiatry services throughout the Houston Methodist system. While use of telepsychiatry has been essential for trying to keep pace with the demand for behavioral health services, it's also come with its own unique challenges. We believe that by attending to these three key pillars of good communication, ensuring accountability, and setting clear expectations, that this will create a solid foundation on which to build a successful telepsychiatry partnership. And that's all I have for you today. Thanks very much. Well, thank you guys so much for those wonderful presentations on telepsychiatry. Um, I have a question, Dr. Kim, on you mentioned that you all used a vendor to kind of scale the model. Can you tell us how receptive uh, your stakeholders were with using a vendor to scale the telepsychiatry model within the hospital? We found that um, the emergency department and the medical uh, floors were really um, eager to have any psychiatry um, support whatsoever. And once they actually got to use the 
um, telepsychiatry vendor and got used to that uh, technology at first, they were really excited about the fact that those services were so readily available 24-7. Um, it really was reassuring for them to know that if they had a psychiatry patient coming in that um, had issues that they before maybe they really weren't sure how to address, they really felt like now we have an on-hand expert that is available anytime to come in and help us when we need it. So as soon as we rolled it out, they were very excited about it, uh, really liked using uh, the services. And I think that was why we saw uh, in part such a dramatic increase, you know, year over year of um, the number of telepsychiatry consults being requested. Wonderful. And Dr. Fox, you had mentioned um, in your presentation um, some of the um, technical components that you all added to your program. Can you tell me about some challenges that you had from a, a technical standpoint and really how did you solve some of those? Um, I think the biggest technical challenge is getting people to use the monitoring. Um, our blood pressure monitor works great. Our smartwatch works great. Uh, it can really track steps and track sleep. We can check oxygen saturation. Um, but the, 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 the real challenge is getting patients to wear the items, to check the, the, the measures, um, and really uh, conveying to them that we're interested in those results. Um, so that's the, sometimes there's technical, just, you know, the patient didn't log on. So the uh, data doesn't get uploaded in time for my visit. And then I'm saying, well, where is it? And they said, well, I did it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, just the frustration of that uh, gap in communication. Um, and sometimes patients just don't really think it's important. So I think that's really the biggest obstacle. Well, thank you both. That was wonderful information. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sharon Arel, and I will introduce to you uh, the telerehabilitation, uh, our program. I'm an uh, occupational therapist from uh, Sheba Beyond, uh, Rehability Online. Uh, three main issues for uh, doing telerehabilitation. 
So the first one is uh, the evidence base. Um, the, the research in neuroscience and especially brain plasticity emphasized the need for in intense treatment and rehabilitation following the acute phase and continuing when the person returns at home. Please, please, let me share screen. Okay, so three reasons. One is the evidence base. Uh, we need the research to, to, uh, to be with us in the, the target of uh, treating people who need rehabilitation for long term. We know that uh, the change in the global demographic uh, tells us that people uh, who live with, with severe uh, injuries live longer and we need to keep going with the rehabilitation uh, process actually for the rest of their life. So uh, this is uh, the, the two, one, one more benefit of uh, the tele-rehabilitation. And the third one, third one is the, the current conventional rehabilitation services that we know that are mostly at clinics today. Uh, they are mostly short-term uh, rehabilitation. And for some people that have limited accessibility, it can be a problem. For example, people that live in rural places or have a, a mobility difficulties. Uh, if we look on a, a, a patients who suffer from neuro neurological injury, for example, we see uh, that in the first phase, in the acute phase, the, the more conventional treatment is, the, is the more popular. And as we go toward the chronic uh, phase, the, the place of the tele-rehabilitation is the getting a grow and grow. And the, when the patients are at home, uh, this is the most uh, uh, important place to do to do the tele rehabilitation. Who are we? We are the tele rehabilitation unit. We, we sit in the rehabilitation center in Shiba Medical Center. We are a multidisciplinary team. We have a, a clinical team, which uh, contain OT, occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, a psychology, speech and language as well as the technology uh, people like uh, engineers and the programmers. We treat all kinds of indications that need rehabilitation. Uh, we started a few years ago, about 10 years ago, uh, long before the COVID-19 came to us. We started with stroke patient and from this point we grew to uh, and expanded our uh, indication to oncologic patients, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease, post-COVID, etc. We have uh, all kind of treatment paths. We have a cognitive treatment uh, by the occupational therapist. We have emotion treatment or physical treatment by the physiotherapist and the occupational therapist. We have a voice treatment and writ in written language, spoken lang language uh, from the SLPs. And uh, we have a, a kind of a group therapy, individual therapy. And the, the last class is the self-practice monitored uh, that I'm going to show you. It's a, a new method that we, uh, we are doing uh, in the last year, last year. In the right picture, you can see one-on-one -on -one session. Uh, the therapist is talking to, uh, to the patient. And on the left side, you can see that the same therapist can see uh, four patients simultaneously. Each patient is doing his own uh, program, his own uh, playlist of uh, exercise, while the therapist can uh, look at the full view like we are now in, in Zoom, and she can look at the one-on-one -on -one, uh, view. So this is a, a new method we establish in, in uh, our service. Uh, as I told uh, earlier, we started on uh, 2009 with the R&D, with the project inception, assembling the team, uh, researches and development. Uh, on uh, 2014, uh, we kicked off with the clinic, with the real service, which uh, uh, serve uh, a lot of patients from Israel and the board. 
uh, which including scheduling, billing, uh, building a distributed uh, therapist team. And uh, uh, we started with focusing on stroke patient. And now we are fo focusing on a variety of, uh, of uh, patient. And uh, now this year on uh, 2022, we are still running the service with expanding more and more disorders, expanding the use of cognitive treatment and new platform. And uh, as well as developing the next generation of the technology. Um, during the years, we had a few uh, domestic and international knowledge transfer uh, programs. So, for example, we had a small pilot with the Mayo Clinic in uh, 2014. Uh, we had uh, a domestic uh, pilot with the, the biggest HMO in Israel, Briut, Shirte Briut Klalit. Uh, on uh, 2019, and uh, we had a, a pilot with the Gosh uh, Hospital in uh, London uh, dealing with rehabilitation of uh, children in uh, 2020. Uh, what are our insights and challenges? So uh, first of all is the operation and challenges. Um, when we speak on a uh, tele-rehabilitation, we would like to have from one hand, the accessibility and personal attention. And this is more like uh, the one-on-one -on -one business model as we know in the conventional uh, treatment in the clinic. From the other hand, we need to be profitable and we, we need to find a, a, a way to do our uh, treatment more uh, profitable. So this is a, a, our way to do a group therapy uh, and uh, as you see uh, earlier, the, the way of doing multiple one-on-one -on -one, uh, session. So this is one way to, for us uh, to deal with this kind of uh, challenge. Uh, the second one is the technology. From one, one hand, we would like the technology to be simple and comfortable to use at home. We don't want a patient uh, to, to wear anything or to put sensors or to use something which is very complicated for, uh, for uh, this kind of population to use. Uh, from, the, from the other hand, we would like the technology to, be, to give us an accurate data. We would like the technology to be very uh, attractive and, um, and to give more motivation to our patient. So this is the... Uh, uh, the other uh, challenge that we are dealing uh, with. Um, and because of these two challenges, we would like to find more partners to advance a teleprogram to find a new method of the combination of these uh, two challenges and, uh, and to think uh, out of the box and not just to, to do the, the actual uh, or the similar conventional treatment uh, to do it on tele, but to find uh, different ways or to use the technology to find a different uh, path uh, to deliver our, our services, our uh, rehabilitation uh, services. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sharon for this uh, ins insightful lectures. We have, we're a little bit in delay, so we'll have just time for one short question. Do you have any information regarding your, uh, the satisfaction rate in your uh, program? And do sometimes patients feel that physical uh, contact is needed? When, when, is it, when does it happen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a, a, a good point that we are uh, dealing uh, we were dealing from, uh, from uh, the when we start uh, 10 years ago, uh, we were really worried about the, the issue of, uh, of the um, treat, um, therapeutic uh, relationship between us and the, and the, and the patient. Uh, so we, you don't have the real uh, eye contact and you cannot touch your, uh, your patient uh, when he needs you. Um, but uh, for our, uh, with our uh, experience, we see that uh, uh, we are you know, like, a, like a family that you see your patient at home. Sometimes you see him on his bedroom, in his living room. You actually see his, uh, his son, his uh, wife or daughter or uh, his family. So 
we actually know them very well. And uh, uh, as we saw in our uh, questionnaire, that the uh, satisfaction questionnaire that we give to our patient, there is a very high uh, satisfaction with this uh, therapeutic connection. Thank you very much. As, as usual, it, it, it depends on the clinician. It depends with the caretaker, if it's a good one and it's able to make a good connection. Uh, that's the thing. It's much more than technology, as was said before. Uh, so thank you very much, Sharon, for your great lecture. And uh, after a uh, five minutes break, uh, please join us for the last session of this evening. And we're really excited to have for our keynote uh, lecture, uh, Professor Steve Glasgow. We'll talk about healthcare in 2032 from COVID-19 to consumer. Thank you. I'm Steve Clasco, and I've had a hell of a morning. You know, time travel is really exhausting. I came back to 2022 from the year 2032 to give you the good news. Thanks to this amazing conference, you have tackled one of the two major existential crises of your time, ensuring equitable health assurance for everyone, and I mean everyone on the planet. You did it. 
You know, today in 2032, I'm the chief digital officer for President Taylor Swift. Yes, the Swifties became a political movement, and they swept the nation and the world. Our slogan? Tailor health care for each individual and make it swift. Pretty cool, huh? I might have written that for her, actually. The Digital Connectivity Act of 2024 was a huge start. It sent the message that everyone deserves access to health care at any address, including your home. It sent the message that we must close the divides in life expectancy that threatened our societies. And it ensured that the digital revolution would not just make the wealthy healthier. In 2022, I was very afraid that we would succumb to the two existential crises of the moment, climate change and health disparities. I actually argued at that time that we needed a Greta Thunberg for health care. By the way, Greta is now on our cabinet. Let me tell you how we did it in healthcare. Back in 2022, I had just left my job as president of Thomas Jefferson University and CEO of Jefferson Health. My mission at that time had been helping a 198-year-old institution act like a startup company. And boy, for any of you who have been in academic medicine, it wasn't easy. In that old era, innovation was fragmented. Vendors spent their days begging hospitals to hear about their revolutionary new products. Too many businesses showed up ready to fail fast and move on, which was a deadly strategy in healthcare. Instead, when I was at Jefferson, we created partnerships based on what we called responsible innovation. Putting ethics first by ensuring that we looked out for the human being in the middle as offline met online. What's more, we tackled health disparities head on by ensuring that the value we created in digital health, that is the money we made, was used to bridge the digital divide. We set out to close the gap and we partnered with companies throughout, throughout the world. We launched this radical collaboration between a traditional academic health system called Jefferson Health in Philadelphia on the one hand, an ecosystem of innovators coming out of Silicon Valley and the venture capital world, and even places like Novartis coming out of traditional pharma. Our biggest announcement in October of 2021, Jefferson created an all-in partnership with the Health Assurance Network of companies backed by the venture capital firm General Catalyst. It was very much based on a book that I had written with the managing director of General Catalyst called Unhealthcare, a Manifesto for Health Assurance. But most importantly, together, we built a new architecture for innovation, where a great idea at Jefferson could be shared in Chicago, or Utah, or California, or even Florida, without the barriers of firewalls, policies, and competition getting in the way. It was sort of like the, the Apple Store for health innovators. This partnership accelerated the promise of health assurance for every individual by, frankly, democratizing healthcare starting at home. There was one really big insight here, and it's this. No one wakes up in the morning thinking or wanting to be a patient. What they want to do is be a person that can thrive and be happy without healthcare getting in the way. So we took that model to heart and we created true connected care at any address. But listen, none of this would have mattered if we hadn't made health equity our goal. That's why in 2021, we announced a major partnership with Novartis called Closing the Gap. We needed to understand exactly how preventable cardiovascular disease hit underserved neighborhoods so hard. By the way, we couldn't do that from sitting in my executive office in the hospital. So what we had to do was we built trust with people in those communities to tackle the issues of screening, diagnosis, care, and prevention. We took it to barbershops, hair salons, churches, community centers, homes. I was on a radio show every Sunday coming into people's living rooms. It worked. So lessons learned, trust matters. In fact, trust is so much more important than technology. We tend to get really excited about the shiny new objects. You have to start with trust. And ethics is in the beginning of that trust. Trust is central to every radical collaboration, and it's central to our relationship with the people we serve. Once we establish that trust by going out into the neighborhoods, then the technology naturally followed. 
You know, it turns out that this revolution that you'll be hearing about over the next 10 years had a couple of key outcomes. It reduced the overall cost of care. It used technology to deliver care to anyone, anywhere. And it helped prevent sick care. Our motto became, how do we assure the health of folks starting at home? And bottom line, it was better for everyone, regardless of their income. Oh, um, I almost forgot. About COVID-19, you probably want to know what happened. Well, um, on January 2nd, 2032, a mutant strain of an RNA encapsulated virus was detected in Australia. Of course, people old enough to remember the dark days of early 20 and the COVID-19 crisis, especially healthcare workers, immediately panicked. But it was only for a second. And then they smiled. Because they knew that healthcare had evolved from a broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable sick care system to a health assurance system where most of their care happens at home. So AI bots instantly identified the new illness, wearables picked up immediate physiologic changes and signaled individuals to self-isolate, home 3D printers cranked out the appropriate filtration mass for the new virus. Anyone panicking, remembering what happened in 2020, could trigger an immediate connection with their bot psychiatrist or psychologist to start monitoring depression or anxiety. Medications, of course, are delivered by drone, so that was pretty easy. With 10G broadband connectivity a given, and of course, with the heroism of, of our leaders making broadband an absolute like electricity and plumbing in 2025, schools and workplaces were now gathering spaces, not human warehouses, and easily converted to all virtual activity. Most importantly, a rapid team of public health professionals, providers, and even business leaders made the rounds of retirement villages to ensure the safety of vulnerable people in communal living. There was this logic where everyone got together to make sure that the most vulnerable people were taken care of first, that it started at home, and that we were making decisions together. Our decade of work to close the gap and reverse health disparities paid off. The new virus found no foothold in poor communities. Regardless of income, the full strength of health care was immediately available wherever it was needed to prevent the spread of illness and aid those who were ill. Just as had been true in your time in 2022, where people had access to Amazon, could still get goods, now for the first time, regardless of where you were, you were able to access health care at a concierge level. Truly, health care at any address, no matter where. Because the locus of health care shifted to the home, individuals were in charge of their own health. And the system had become adept at assessing and helping to build community resiliency and family strength. Oh, and by the way, that's how most of the people that are doing what I did back in 2022 as a health system leader got paid. Not by doing more, not by where they were in rankings, but by how well they were taking care of their community. <laughs> Quite a far cry from what you're now witnessing and what I witnessed throughout the globe during the COVID crisis of 2020. I'm really delighted to join you today with this, what we call, history of the future. The lesson learned is, as Steve Jobs taught us, always look for what will be obvious in 10 years from now and just start doing it now. Every one of you at this meeting is part of this revolution. I'm really excited to join you. Oh, and, and I have one more surprise. I'm not really me. I'm a hologram of me coming to you from 2032 to assure that you got it right. So remember, be tailored and be swift. See you later. So, so now that I'm not a hologram, um, I wanted to give you sort of an idea of how we do Shiba and beyond and how we do telehealth and beyond. And, and my learning on this came from working for Apple uh, before I became a CEO in, in the early 2000s, pre-iPhone, pre-iPad. And Everyone else in that industry was thinking incrementally. Microsoft, Dell, Gateway. And this is what was happening at the Worldwide Developer Conference in Microsoft. So you can just daisy chain up, up to 127 USB devices here. That's an everyday task. Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device. And it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build, whoa. <laughs> Moving right along. That must be, uh, 
it must be why we're not shipping Windows 98. Absolutely. Yet. So while, while those folks were thinking incrementally, and just like we might be thinking incrementally about telehealth, Apple and Steve Jobs was thinking about what was going to be obvious 10 years from now and saying, you know, computers and operating systems are going to be a commodity. And one could argue that hospital stays will be very similar. So he was thinking back in the year 2000, this. And this is what the front of it looks like. Boom. That's iPod. I happen to have one right here in my pocket, matter of fact. <laughs> there it is, right there. So, by the way, I did not keep my Apple options, but you can see what happened to Apple literally as they start to think about a very, very different future. And then you can think about things like Dell and, and Gateway and where they went. So what I think has relevance over the next 10 minutes for this conference as we think about telehealth and beyond is instead of doing a really sort of thick uh, strategic and business plan, um, Steve went to John Scully and said, here's my three-year strategic plan. Year one, we change. Year two, we change the industry. Year three, we change the world. And I took some of that when I, when I came to Jefferson. Basically, I recognize that at some point, we're going to be paid based on quality, cost, patient experience, and outcomes. That what was the primary source of our revenue, hospital stays will be commoditized. That it took us 50 years to get doctors and nurses to work together. Now we're going to have to get doctors and robots to work together. By the way, we have the third largest medical school in the country, so maybe we shouldn't just be selecting and educating students based on being able to memorize the Krebs cycle when there's going to be better technology to do that. And really what I'm doing now in the VC world, how do we take population health predictive analytics and social determinants from philosophic and academic exercises to the mainstream of clinical care payment models and medical education. In essence, how could I turn this 195 year old AMC into a, a startup company? Now we don't need a whole lot more warning signs because our traditional revenue, what I call the old math of inpatient revenue, outpatient revenue, uh, NIH funding and in-person tuition is really being threatened. And that's why Moody's and Standard & Poor's have looked at us as, as negative. But I think the, the difference is to look at it very differently. I'm a distinguished fellow of the World Economic Forum and, and at the last one that's got reported in The Economist, I was talking with one of the leaders of uh, CEOs of, of a large finance entity. And he said, you know, 40 years ago, the two entities, sectors that, that escaped the consumer revolution were banking and healthcare. And he took a sip of his coffee and he said, now you're alone. And if you think about that, we don't get up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to tell a bank. It's just that banking went from being very inconvenient to being very convenient. This is Sebastian Thrun, who was the founder of Google X. And he said, the problem in American healthcare isn't that we aim too high and fail. It's that we aim too low and exactly hit the mark. We've been very risk averse in our world. So really what you need to look at in the world that I now live in, which is not nonprofit academic system, but literally the folks that are funding that in the VC world, the, in the right, this is, what they're, this is what they're creating, virtual care, home care, next gen primary care clinics, retail clinics. If we're not in that game, if we're just literally helping the next innovators and founders create billion dollar companies, then literally we will go the way of Dell and Gateway. But here's the, here's the rub. It's our reputation, it's our patients, it's our, our physicians and staff, and we need to also be in this game. And we have to think about data in a very different way. My car gets better care than I do. Every morning when I turn it on, it says, Steve, hey, um, by the way, while you were sleeping, my right front passenger tire got a little low, could you fill it up? Meanwhile, I'm gonna go for a physical two weeks from now, and somebody's gonna tell me on April 28th, this is, what your blood pressure was is what your calcium score was. This is what you should do for the next year. So as you start to think about telehealth very differently, this is where I think we're, we're moving. We're moving to a model where we're going from sick care to health assurance, from hospital to home, from static continu continuous data, from humans being able to memorize things to humans as use humans. And really for the purposes of this conference from telehealth, this is a great uh, study that was done by the AMA. And we're already seeing a decrease in, in folks in telehealth. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's good. People are doing a mix of in-person telehealth visits. Some patients prefer to come in person. Uh, but literally what we're finding is a lot of mixed, really impact on, on digitally enabled care. You can see it's really mixed. Are we decreasing the cost of care? 65% of physicians felt that most of the telehealth visits they provide replace care delivered in person. Other physicians felt that literally 65%, 63% felt that most of the telehealth visits they provide supplement in-person care. And then when you actually think about what that means to, to, to actual patients, 
this is where it really gets difficult. And that is that it's hard to get someone to do something when their salary depends upon them not doing it. The first three barriers are all around payment. Rollback of COVID-19 waivers, coverage, and payment policies, lack of insurance coverage, lower or no, lower or no reimbursement. So one of the things that we have to move when we think about telehealth, again, and we, and we think about banking, is health is health. A visit should be a visit. And it is really asinine, in my opinion, that literally you would get paid differently for a telehealth versus an in-person visit. So I think as we get away from telehealth, what, what I've been espousing is healthcare at any address. That whether it's Jefferson or Mount Sinai or Sheba or Houston Methodist, we should be defined not by where our sickest patients go, but based on our care and caring. So when somebody comes to, to Houston and they say, where is Methodist? Somebody comes to Philadelphia and say, where is Jefferson? Literally, I hope you won't be able to define that. You mean on my phone, on my iPad, uh, in micro hospitals, the place where really, really sick people will be the same. So this is where I believe telehealth is moving toward. You had five asthma attacks last week, David. What's going on? Not feeling well. We got a, I got a cold starting. Had to go to Barstow twice for work. <clears throat> Barstow's nice and dry. What's your asthma keeping you from doing? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, normal life for starters. Like walk upstairs, play with the kids, go see a movie. Okay, well, here's some weather for you. And I can't say it's nice out. Your neighborhood AQI is 160, humidity's down, and particulate matter's up, so you'll have a 65% increased risk of an attack today. You got some popcorn in the house? Ah, uh, sure. I get it. Not going out today. Right. And keep your Advair inhaler nearby. Okay. Every two hours, I take one shot, right? That's it. You want me to remind you when you need to take it? Send me an SMS. Okay. Talk with you soon. So every piece of that now exists. And I think as we, again, start to think about telehealth and think about that individual that didn't have to drive into a hospital literally to get that, that continuous data evaluation and bringing in the external factors, how important that is. But there's also a piece for our survival in, in, in traditional healthcare. And this is a real live picture of HIMSS where 870, 28 year olds are telling you that if you buy their app, They'll transform healthcare. And what we decided at Jefferson is rather, rather, rather think about it differently. This is Hamon Tanasia, who is one of the initial investors in Airbnb, Warby Parker, and Stripe. All three of those, whether it was hospitality, uh, contact lenses, and, and eyeglasses, or finance, were how do we move from the scaled version of building bigger, better hotels to an unscaled version of connecting people? We wrote a book called Unhealthcare, thinking about how sick care could give way to this affordable, personalized, and preemptive care as genomic sensors and AI-based digital therapies go. But more importantly for Jefferson, that became a portfolio diversification opportunity for us. Here's one thing we did. We took our entire digital innovation and consumer experience group, merged it with a group from General Catalyst and created a company that we co-owned called Tendo. So this is an opportunity where vendors became strategic partners. And it really had a dual purpose. One is all of a sudden I had this individual on my cabinet who really understood everything about taking that patient engagement and digital strategy and helping me make sure that everybody that wanted to see a Jefferson physician or nurse could. But also I became an investor in, in that so that literally we were actually a partner as opposed to a vendee. The concept of being a vendor vendee turned into a strategic partner, which really has been a real opportunity for us for Tendo CEO sitting on our cabinet and for Jefferson diversifying our portfolio. So in essence, as we start to go from sick care to health assurance, we start to look at patients as people. And we were under, able to understand that 98% of those people uh, viewed Jefferson as the key to thriving without health getting in the way. So when they got sick, they weren't going up and down the expressway to see which one of us had the cooler billboard. So in essence, Jefferson became the intermediary between the digital so solutions and the consumer. And real briefly over the next five minutes, how do we change the industry? Well, we really have to think about the human in the middle when this online starts to meet offline. And I think about everything as BC, DC, and KAC, before COVID, during COVID, and kind of after COVID. And I think one of the things that we have to think about are all these things that relates to humans, but as it relates to the consumer, we have to think of marketing very differently. This is a satire that The Onion did about healthcare marketing in the United States, a cute kid with a flower, a serious doctor with a goo-goo glass, and something that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
That's where we spend our money. The key in spending our money in marketing is how do we use telehealth? How do we use digital strategies to guide consumers by giving them the information they need? How do we find convenient ways for consumers to connect with the healthcare community? I want to be target of Walmart. When Amazon disrupted that industry, some folks said, oh my God, nobody's ever going to star store, think Circuit City. Sears and Penny said, boy, what a stupid fad. Target and Walmart said, we're really good at what we do, but we're also going to be out there for the folks at home. That's what we need to think about when it comes to healthcare. And finally, how do we change the world? I think it's going to take radical communication, radical collaboration, and a radical concentration on health disparities. We have to stop just talking about it. This sickens me that in Philadelphia, and it's probably true where you are also, the number one reason you ended up in the hospital or died from, from COVID was because of your zip code. If you didn't have broadband and you were being listening on CNN, don't go to the hospital in May of 2020, and you had chest pain, many of those folks went to sleep not having the right education. So I believe, and a good part of the reason that I'm now in the role that I'm in, both at Sheba and at General Catalyst, is how do we create those large scale transformations? How do we make sure that the disruption will, and creative partnerships really don't just make the wealthy healthier? How do we make sure that the fourth industrial revolution of genomics, AI, drones, robotics, give us the tools and data to do the, what we need to do and proactively address the human and ethical consequences? And I'll leave you with this quote from um, Jason Kidd when he joined the Dallas Mavericks in the NBA. We're now starting the finals. He, um, he gave, and the team was 24 and 52. He said, um, we're going to turn this team around 360 degrees. We do a lot of turning things around 360 degrees in healthcare. And I hope this kind of conference or partnership with Sheba will be a major change of, of saying we're moving forward, thinking about what's going to be obvious 10 years from now and doing it today. Thank you. So I do, I, I think I am the closing um, speaker and I think I'm just gonna jump in right now and um, address you all in, the, in closing remarks. So I do want to um, uh, thank everyone profusely uh, for this conference today. My name is Roberta Schwartz. I'm the executive vice president at Houston Methodist Hospital. And um, we do wanna thank you for participating in the future directions in virtual medicine. Um, when, you know, this, this really got conceived and unfortunately postponed a number of times due to COVID surges, very glad that we were able to um, complete this incredible conference today. Um, and really, as we look at those surges, we can celebrate the fact that we all use technology to its maximum um, during the time of COVID, but also recognize more than ever from our clinicians and from the public, the power that virtual medicine and kind of an electronified future in looking at in combination, and I completely agree with Professor Clasco, um, in really looking at a combined digital world, uh, the physical and the digital, will bring to the future today, certainly celebrating the, the strides in the future that we have in digital medicine. When we look at putting the patient in the center of everything, as um, uh, Steve just uh, spoke about, we really look at the fact that we can treat them both in the office and at home. Um, both if you're a hospitalized patient and a non-hospitalized patient. So we have to take those lessons that we can learn from each other and really put them into practice as quickly as we can. Um, we're now looking at, at a really a future and uh, we have Israel to thank for many things coming along on the um, remote world and the remote sensor world. And whether we look at some of the companies who um, have already uh, spawned huge futures like Taito or BioBeat or other kinds of remote sensors, we will be able to do far more in terms of the work that can get done in having people outside of the healthcare environment being linked in the way that um, Steve just spoke about that your car is linked. Now we're really going to be able to link people in a much bigger way. To say thank you is an understatement to all of the organizers for this conference, 
Dr. Ayal, Dr. Kalia, uh, Professor Klafko, uh, your great teams who put together this incredible agenda. Dr. Pletcher, our uh, subject matter expert, Arisha Greenwood, Rachel Bishop, Marat, Ulkaran, um, Josh Sol, Karina Keenman, Lindsay Randall from the Houston Methodist team. Um, these kind of collaborations should not be understated, particularly when uh, we have learned to collaborate much more um, in spite of the walls because of the technology that we have um, embraced throughout COVID. Um, and as we really come down to um, an incredible time of year with Passover, with Easter, with um, Ramadan upcoming, but with also those in the Ukraine who are suffering so very much right now. Um, I, I wish you all a season of peace, of prayer, um, of hope for the future, and um, of continued collaborations that we may have together, such as this virtual conference. So thank you all very, very much.